Okay, we're going to draw some conclusions. And I've got a section that is called miscellaneous. Okay, miscellaneous points. It's just a number of things, verses that um, have come to mind or issues that have come to mind that are part of this discussion regarding Calvinism. Um, uh, there are, well, there's a lot of verses that sometimes seem to say what Calvinists say. And we're going to cover some of those. Um, there's some others, like we're going to touch on Romans chapters 9 through 11 tonight. But we're just going to touch on it because it is way too big an area. Um, I mean, it, it would take six or eight or ten messages to do justice to those three chapters, okay, which is about, what about the Jews? Okay, that's the question there. What about the Jews? They were God's chosen people, and now all of a sudden we have the church, which is made up mostly of Gentiles. What about the Jews? And it answers that question. And uh, there are some verses there that Calvinists like to use that, uh, like I say, we will touch on tonight. Um, okay, some conclusions. We've talked about TULIP. We've talked about the Calvinist idea of sovereignty. Well, I want to start off by giving my answer and the answer of, of some other folks to the question, what does Calvinism do to the character of God? Okay, by Calvinism, let's, let's just review quickly. By Calvinism we mean um, doctrines that are spelled out by the acrostic tulip a uh, total depravity of man. Um, man cannot save himself, and according to Calvinism, man is completely incapable of understanding the gospel and exercising faith in Christ. He does not have that ability to believe. He's without it. It's like uh, there's something missing in there that he simply cannot believe. Um, so that's total depravity. Unconditional election, God in eternity past looked down through time and just chose people to be saved. Chose certain ones who would believe and would not believe. And it is without condition, so there is no reason for it except God willed to do it that way. Okay? Um, unconditional election. Limited atonement. Christ only died for those whom He chose ahead of time to save. He did not die for the rest of mankind. Um, I have heard Calvinists say, you've got to be careful about saying Christ died for you. Because if that person is not elect that you're talking to, then He did not die for them. Okay, so you cannot say Jesus died and paid for your sins to someone. Okay, which that is so foreign to the Word of God, it's just amazing. Okay, read the book of Acts. You've got sermons by Peter and Paul and Stephen and other people, and none of them ever hesitate to say Jesus died for you. Jesus paid for your sins. You know, He wants to save your soul. <laughs> this, that's just nonsense. Okay, so that's limited atonement. Uh, the I is irresistible grace. Uh, that God, basically He imposes His will upon you. He decided, I'm going to save you, and you have nothing whatever to say about it. You don't decide to accept Christ. You think you do, okay, but you don't. It's not your decision. God decided and then he, he gives to you this grace that is impossible for you to resist. 
Okay, so you cannot say, no, I don't, I don't want to believe that. Okay, it's not possible. Irresistible grace. The last one is perseverance of the saints. That if you are one of those chosen ones, you will persevere to the end. Uh, you will make it to your final salvation because you will never fall away from faith or good works. Okay, and it's not the same thing as saying God keeps you. God saved you and keeps you saved, and instead it's you will keep yourself saved because God chose you. Okay, it does not give assurance of salvation. There are, I, I have heard a number of Calvinists who doubt their salvation, which is, it just really is funny. Because all of this is supposedly completely dependent on something God did before He created the universe. Before the foundation of the earth, God made all these decisions. And because it's God making the decisions, they can never be changed. They're immutable. So if God picked you, how could you possibly end up in hell? And if God didn't pick you, nothing you do could possibly get you to heaven. Okay? So when it's all said and done, nothing matters. Okay? Nothing matters. Uh, because it's all predetermined. Okay? And there's nothing you or I can ever do about it. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about consequences of Calvinist doctrine tonight. We're going to talk about the ramifications of Calvinist doctrine. Where does this lead us? If these things are true, then what kind of a God do we have? Okay, so let's start off with this question. Is God holy? Now the Bible makes it very, very, very clear that God is holy. Uh, most Christians would consider this, at least a lot of Christians would say, this is God's foremost attribute. Okay, the most important attribute of all. He is holy. He's completely sinless, completely righteous. He cannot do wrong. He cannot think wrong. But Calvinism, remember, says that God made Adam and Eve sin in the garden. God determined. Okay, the Calvinist idea of sovereignty is that the will of God can never, can never be thwarted. So anything that happens has to be God's will. And they will say that we're not talking about God allowing someone to do something that's wrong. Instead, we're talking about God making that person do wrong. Because if, if He has a will to choose to do wrong, then God is no longer sovereign. Now that is crazy logic, but that's what they believe. That's what Calvinism teaches. Okay? So if you committed a sin today, God made you do it. Okay? If you thought a bad thought, if you did something that was wrong, if you lost your temper when it's not justified or whatever, it's in the will of God. It happened, so it has to be God's will. And that means God made it happen. Okay? Now, is that a holy God? That's not a holy God. Okay? The Bible makes it very clear God cannot do that. Okay? In an earlier message we looked at James chapter 1. Okay? That God is not tempted with evil, neither tempteth He any man. God cannot be tempted to do wrong, and He does not tempt anyone else to do wrong. He does not cause evil. There are things that God allows to happen and sometimes those kind of boggle the mind. You know, how could God even allow this? 
But the Calvinist says God doesn't allow things, God causes things. Okay, bad things, wrong things, evil things. Um, so Calvinists insist God determined, he, he chose to cause two innocent people, Adam and Eve, to sin. And since God's sovereign will can never be thwarted, He causes everything that happens. Um, could we consider any person who causes someone else to sin to be holy? If a, if a human being tempts someone to do something wrong, would we say that human being that provided the temptation is holy? Of course not. But how is it that the Calvinist says God is holy even though He causes people to do wrong? Okay, I don't think you can have it both ways. Either God is holy and He has given man a free will, or God is unholy and causes man to do evil. Okay, they want to have it both ways, and I don't think you can. And biblically, I don't, I don't believe there's any grounds for any of this. Um, is God just? Is God just? Is He fair? Well, yes, He's just. He is fair. Is God righteous? Is He just when He condemns people to eternal hell? Yes, He is. But if you accept the tenets of Calvinism, now you've got a God who makes them do wrong and then punishes them for what He made them do. Is that justice? No, it's not. Okay, so the God of Calvinism is not just. The God of the Bible is just. But the God of Calvinist theology is not just. Um, a judge who condemns people for sins he made them commit could not be considered just. Um, is God merciful? Well, He's merciful to a chosen few. To a few. But He's not merciful to the ten billion or so souls who have lived in time that He made to sin and from whom He withholds the ability to believe. Okay, supposedly God gives the ability to the elect to put their faith in Christ. He regenerates them and enables them to believe. And without that you cannot be saved. Well, why doesn't everybody have that ability? Because God has chosen to withhold that ability from the vast majority. Okay, so can we say this is mercy? When He has chosen, He has made 10 billion people, and He has chosen a small percentage to believe it and be saved by it. Um, is God honest? Of course God's honest. The Bible says God who cannot lie. Okay? He cannot lie. Um, but if God says world, okay, think of this. Here's Nicodemus came to Jesus by night because he didn't want anybody to see him hanging around with Jesus. Okay, he came to Jesus by night and he asked him some questions. And Christ cut through all the malarkey and went straight to the gospel. You must be born again. Okay, he reminded Nicodemus of the story in the Old Testament where the serpent was lifted up and they had to look up and live. Okay, and he said that this is like the Son of Man. The Son of Man has to be lifted up on the cross in the same way that whosoever believeth in Him would not perish but have eternal life. Okay? Um, so he reminds him of this and he says to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world. 
But he didn't mean world. He meant elect. He was speaking in a special language understood by Calvinists alone. Okay, and world did not mean world. It meant elect. That whosoever, which the ordinary meaning of whosoever means anybody who chooses to. Whosoever believeth, but to the Calvinist, that is the elect only. Because only the elect can possibly believe. The rest do not have the ability to believe. Okay, so Christ is speaking to Nicodemus. It seems he's telling Nicodemus how to go to heaven. But instead of world, he means elect. And instead of whosoever, he means elect. And Nicodemus is only going to go to heaven if he is one of the elect. And like I said this morning, there is no list. You can't Google, you know, am I one of the elect? Okay, and get an answer. Is this honest? It's not honest. If I were to use that kind of language and talk to you in that way where I'm using words that have a common, well-known meaning, but I'm using them in a special, secret fashion that only the initiated understand, would you say I'm being honest? I think you'd say I'm being deceitful. Well, I think God's more righteous and more holy than I am. Okay, I think he's more honest than I am. Okay, but not the God of Calvinism. You see, he says one thing and he means another. And that's not honesty. Um, is God loving? Well, doesn't the Bible say God is love? Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave His Son to be the propitiation for our sins? The Bible says God is loving. The Bible says God is so loving, He sent His Son to die for everybody. Which, of course, doesn't mean everybody. <laughs> okay? Is God loving? Okay, take Calvinist sovereignty. God makes every decision. You don't make decisions. Okay? God this afternoon, well, no, pardon me, because all the decisions were made before the foundation of the world. God is not making any decisions today. Why He can't, I'm not quite sure. Okay, I'm going to use our brother Howard here for another illustration. He wore a common garden variety tie this morning. It was quite a nice tie. It was a very attractive tie. Okay, but it was, an, it was a normal tie. Okay. Now, this, this evening, he has a tie with a self-portrait on it. Okay. Now, those were his words. I mean, he didn't say self-portrait, but he said it was him on the tie. Okay. It's got Yosemite Sam. Or no, pardon me, the Tasmanian devil. Okay, the Tasmanian devil on his tie. So in eternity past, God decided that Howard would wear a plain tie for the morning service and a not so plain tie for the evening service. He didn't want you to be disappointed. There you go. Okay. I mean, I have had Calvinists tell me God chooses your ties. That's nuts. Um, but, okay, let's get serious. If the Calvinist idea of the sovereignty of God is true, and if TULIP is true, then God could save everyone. He could save every person who has ever lived. Okay, I suppose if he wanted to make 
an example out of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong, you know, and a few other scoundrels throughout history, um, you know, we probably wouldn't throw a fit over that. But uh, he has chosen to condemn billions and billions and billions and billions of people that he could just have easily have saved. Okay? Does that sound to you like a loving God? I mean, the Bible is very descriptive about how they are going to spend their eternity, and it's almost beyond imagination. God is just in condemning people to hell. But is it loving if He could have simply chosen to save them all and didn't? I don't think that's love. Okay? I praise God that these things we have said here are not true. Okay? God is loving. He is just. He is fair. He is honest. He is holy. All these wonderful, precious attributes of God, and, and this is just scratching the surface of the attributes of God. He is so great. He is so marvelous. And, and I mean, some of the songs we sang tonight, praising our wonderful God. Okay? I, I praise the Lord that He is not the God that you have to conclude is the God of Calvinism. Okay? They are willing to sacrifice all of these wonderful attributes to maintain their crazy idea of what sovereignty means. Sovereignty does not mean God makes every decision. Okay? Um, we're going to look at some things in a bit, but in, a, in an earlier message we talked about um, Christ before Pontius Pilate. And Jesus was silent before Pilate. And Pilate says, you're not going to answer me? Don't you know I have power to crucify you or I could set you free? Don't you know? And Jesus replied, you would have no power over me at all except it was given you from above. Okay, God gives power to men. Pontius Pilate could have let Christ go. He had the ability to make that decision, but he chose to crucify him instead. Okay? Man has a free will. You really make choices. Howard really chose that tie. Okay? Our choices are real. They're genuine. They're not imaginary. You don't... Th the idea is God lets you think you made a decision. I even read one Calvinist that says God gives false faith to some people so that they think they're, they're saved and they're not. Oh boy, that's a good God, isn't it? Okay? Anyway, okay. So, in a nutshell... That's what Calvinism does to the character of God. And I think we could expand on that by looking at some other attributes. But those are the main ones that I wanted to see. Now, uh, some miscellaneous points. And so now we're going to get to some scripture. Um, Romans chapter 10, verse 13 to 17. And then we'll look at Ephesians chapter 1 as well. How does a person come to faith in Christ? Okay, how does a person really come to faith in Christ? Uh, Romans chapter 10, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You call on the name of Christ and you're saved. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. 
For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? You notice they don't all believe. They hear. Some believe and some don't. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Okay, William Carey, who is called the father of modern missions, was talking to a group of unbelievably, incredibly, Baptist preachers about going to India to preach the gospel to the people of India. And he was told by somebody in that meeting, young man, if God wants to convert the heathen, he can do it without your help. Now, does this sound like how shall they believe if they haven't heard? How shall they hear unless somebody preaches? How shall they preach except they be sent? Okay? Somebody's got to tell them. They don't just wake up one day and say, oh, I think I'll believe in a person I've never even heard of. I've never heard his name. But I'm going to put my faith in this this one that no one has ever even told me about. It doesn't work that way. Okay, faith comes by hearing. Somebody's got to take the message. Okay, you've heard people say, somebody told you. Have you told anybody else? There's a, I think there used to be a song, if I remember right, um, Andrew told his brother, have you told yours? Okay, Andrew heard the gospel, and what did he do? He went straight home and told Peter. Okay? Um, God uses us to get the message out. He uses us. We've got to be faithful in doing that. Okay? Because faith comes by hearing. If they never hear, they'll never believe. Okay? It's very, very simple. That's how people come to faith. Ephesians chapter 1. That we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. How did you trust Christ? Somebody had to give you the gospel. You couldn't believe it until you heard it. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, and so on. Okay? You hear it. You're convicted of it. Does the Holy Spirit work in this situation? Of course He does. God sent the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay, that's the work of the Spirit. But you carry the message. Okay, the Holy Spirit doesn't tap people on the shoulder and say, pardon me, can I ask you a question? If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Okay, that's never happened. Never happened. Okay, but people go out and do that, and then the Holy Spirit works. But until they hear the gospel, they don't have a chance. Um, okay, um, another point that, that goes right along with this. What you do matters. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 8 and 9. And there are several verses here that are very, very good. I only chose a couple of them. Uh, but read it in the context. Um, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. Okay, do people go to hell because you don't tell them? Well, not really. They go to hell because of their own sin. Okay? But, he says... His blood will I require at thine hand. Okay? If you know to tell them and you don't tell them, then there is blame to be placed on you. Okay? He goes to hell for his own sin, but you're in sin for not telling him. And you will answer for that. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Okay, you do your part. If they don't believe it, it's not your fault. 
Okay? We cannot make a person believe. It's up to them. Okay? But we have to take the message. Um, Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and 27. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. The Apostle Paul says that I am pure from the blood of all men because I told everybody I could. Okay? I preached the gospel. I declared the whole counsel of God. And so I am free from the blood of all men. Nobody can say I'm in hell because of you. Okay? Um, does man have a free will? We've already discussed the situation of Christ before Pilate, but here's another passage that makes it very, very clear what, does, what God has done regarding free will. Psalm 8, verse 5 through 8. For thou hast made him, that's mankind, man, a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion, over the works of thy hands thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. Okay? Mankind is in charge of this planet. God made it, and he turned it over to men and to women. Okay, when I say man, I'm not talking about, you know, one gender. Okay, and of course you realize there's only two genders. Um, not, not a multitude. Uh, you know, you can decide whatever you want to be. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, but God gave us dominion. Okay, we run this planet. All the things that he made, he turned over to us to use as we see fit. We make the decisions. Okay? Um, so man has a free will given him by God. Okay? We, you know, when you delegate authority to somebody else, you don't lose your own authority. Okay? But you give the job to somebody else, and guess what? They have to answer to you. Okay? When Christ is in front of Pilate and he says, don't you know I have the power? Well, guess what? Those two are going to get together again at the great white throne. But this time Jesus is the judge and Pilate is the accused. And Pilate will be cast into hell. Now, you know the Greek Orthodox Church has Saint Pontius Pilate? They do. Okay? Now, I'm not an expert on Greek Orthodoxy, but I was told that. And the, they have a saint's day but for Pontius Pilate and his wife. And they believe that he came to faith in Christ. And I hope he did. Okay? If not, he's been in Hades ever since he died and will be cast into the lake of fire. And I hope that doesn't happen to him. I hope he's a saved man and we'll get to see him in heaven and say, how can you be so stupid? You know? <laughs> Anyhow. Um, uh, here's something touching on the ideas of perseverance of the saints and lordship salvation. Okay, perseverance of the saints says that if you're really born again, you cannot do a bunch of wicked things and lose your salvation. It's not possible. You have to live a good life to persevere to the end. Lordship salvation says that you've got to, at the time of your faith and throughout the rest of your life, you have got to live in submission to the Lordship of Christ. He's, he's the master and I, I obey Him. I follow Him. Well, let me ask you this. I was reading the Bible one time and I, I hit a verse and I thought, wait a minute. That's completely contrary to perseverance of the saints and lordship salvation. Can a man or a woman be a believer and a disciple but keep it secret? Can you be a secret disciple? 
of Christ. I mean, that seems to be an oxymoron. Secret disciple? Okay, how do you be a follower? How do you be a learner? How do you, you know, live in submission to Christ and keep it a secret? But can you do that? And the answer is yes. Because the Bible says it happened. Okay? Look in uh, John chapter 19, verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, who helped embalm the body of Jesus and gave him his tomb, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Okay, here's a saved man who after Christ dies finally finds the courage to let other people know that he's saved. He's been covering it up for quite a long time now because he's afraid of what the other Jews will say. Um, well, Lordship Salvation would say this isn't possible. And so would Calvinism. Say, no, this isn't possible. But it happened. Okay? Um, John chapter 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on Him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess Him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. And again, they're hiding their faith. Now, some people would say of this passage, well, they only pretended to believe. They, were, they didn't have saving faith. But what does the Bible say? Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on Him. Okay, the Holy Spirit inspired these words, and the Holy Spirit says that these chief rulers believed in Christ. Okay, and, and the Gospel of John makes very, very clear what they mean by faith, by believing. Okay, these are saved men, but they hid it because they were afraid of what other people would think and do. Um, can a true believer practice sin? Can a true believer, if a person has saving faith, can a true believer practice sin? And the answer is yes. Now I want you to look, here's, here's something you've probably heard. I can remember hearing this very shortly after I got saved, and honestly it confused me. Um, 1 John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Okay, and the standard interpretation of this verse is that while all born-again people on this earth are still sinners, we cannot habitually practice sin. Now, that doesn't fit the true experience of the vast majority of Christians. Um, the fact is, that we all have weaknesses, we all have besetting sins, and it says the sin which does so easily beset us. Okay? We all have sins that unfortunately we do the same things over and over and over and over again. And if that's not practice, then what is it? Okay? We practice sin. Now, they say, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, and this is present continuous tense, and it means to habitually practice. And if you're really saved, you cannot practice sin. You will sin occasionally, very occasionally sometimes, um, but you will not practice sin. Okay, now let's look at this. The word commit is the word poeo in the Greek, and it means do. Okay? Whosoever is born of God doth not do sin. And present continuous, it simply means that you're doing it at the present time. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean over and over and over and over again. It says you cannot do sin. Why? For his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he's born of God. I think this very clearly is talking about your new birth. And your new birth is perfect. Your new birth is holy. It cannot sin. The problem is you've still got your old birth. Okay? Which does sin. 
Now look in Romans chapter 7, verse 19. This is really good here, I think. Um, For the good that I would, I do not. Okay, the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Okay, the good that I want to do, I want to do right. But I don't do it. And guess what? The word here is poeo, and it's in the present tense. So the good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I would not, that, you know, you, you fall into sin, you do something wrong, and you're kicking yourself, and the Holy Spirit's convicting you, and you say, man, I wish I could stop this. Okay, the, you don't want to do it, that I do. This is a different Greek word for do. It's the word proso. Proso. And you know what the definition of this word is? The definition, the meaning of the word is practice. That's what the word means. Okay? The good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I wish I didn't do, I practice. I do it all the time. Now this is the Apostle Paul speaking. He's being very honest with us. That we have a new nature, we have an old nature. Okay? And the new nature only does good, the old nature only does bad. And unfortunately it does it a whole lot more than it ought to. Okay? Can we improve that situation? Yes, we can, and we don't have the time for it. But the end of chapter 7 and most of chapter 8 is to, has to do, and of course you have to go back to chapter 6. I mean, the 6, 7, and 8 are all about having victory in the Christian life. Okay, and you don't have to continually, continually, continually. You can get better. Okay, you can serve the Lord. Um, All right, but can a true believer practice sin? Yes, he can, and unfortunately, an awful lot of us do. Um, Will a true believer? Wow. I'm on. I'm, I'm on the top of page three. Okay, I've got two and a quarter pages to go. Um, We'll try to be fast. Can a true or will a true believer always manifest good works? Well, not if Romans chapter seven is true. You will manifest them sometimes, and other times you won't. And that's the truth. Okay, there are sometimes Christians don't act like Christians, and that's a shame. But it's the truth. And if we're honest, we'll all admit, yeah, that's me sometimes. Okay, that's, that's me. It wasn't just Paul. I mean, goodness gracious, if Paul felt that way, then what about the rest of us? Okay? Um, okay. Um, if it always happens, why does God have to give us a commandment? Uh, Titus 3.8 This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. He gives us a commandment. If you have believed in God, you should maintain good works. Okay, and you should be careful or diligent about it. Okay, let's work at it. Let's be good. Okay, it's not automatic. It doesn't happen automatically for every person who has exercised saving faith. Did you know saving faith is never found in the Bible? Okay, there's a lot of preachers that talk about saving faith as though there's a different kind of faith. There's unsaving faith and there's saving faith. No, there's just faith. Okay, that's all there is, is just faith. Um, James chapter 2. My brethren. Who's he talking to? Christians. Brethren. Okay, and there are 
about 15 other times in the book of James where he talks to brethren. Okay? This whole book is written to Christians. It's not telling anybody how to get saved. It's telling us how to live. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. If there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, there also come in a poor man in vile raiment. Ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. Say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place. Say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and have become judges of evil thoughts? Okay? Hearken, my beloved brethren. He's talking to Christians. Okay, and here's this church of saved people, and a rich guy comes in, and boy, he's dressed fancy. I mean, he just drove up in a Porsche. Okay, this guy's got bucks. All right, and what do we, what do, we do? We give him a nice chair with a footstool. Okay, then a poor guy comes in. He's just off the street and he's dressed crummy. He doesn't look like he's shaved lately or taken a bath. What do we do? Well, you could sit here on, on the floor. Okay, that's what they're doing. Rich guy, oh, sit here, brother. Poor guy, well, we got a spot on the floor for you over here. Okay, and he says, this, these are evil thoughts. This is wrong. Okay, this is not only written to brethren, it's written to brethren in sin. This is a church, and beloved, I, guess what? This happens more than we'd like to admit. Okay, if you've been saved any length of time and in, been in more than one church, you have probably run into situations where some guy is sitting on the board, <coughs> he's wretched, he's wicked, He's ungodly, but he's got money. Okay? Now, I've known of that to happen. The people making the decisions are the ones with the bucks. Okay? And that's wrong. That is wrong. Being rich doesn't make you godly. Being rich doesn't necessarily make you ungodly. Okay? I've known some rich men who were wonderful Christians. And I've known some poor men very poor men, who were wonderful Christians. Um, okay, anyhow. Um, so it's written to brethren. Uh, look in verse, verse 6, the first phrase, ye have despised the poor. Okay, he's, he's not covering this up. He's not sugarcoating it. Uh, verse 9, if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. This is serious. He's saying, folks, this is wrong. Okay, this chapter is not written to tell people if you're really saved, you're going to live good. Okay, this chapter is telling people who are really saved that you're despicable. Okay, and you need to get right with the Lord. That's what he's telling them. Um, he reminds them that they are accountable to God. Look in verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Okay, you and I are judged by God all the time. There are a lot of verses in the Bible that talk about how God chastens His children. And this is something He does to us right here and now in this life. Okay, He judges us on a daily basis. There's also the judgment seat of Christ that we are going to stand at someday. Only God's children get chastened. Okay, Hebrews chapter 12. He chastens his children. The judgment seat of Christ is only for people who have trusted Christ and they are in the church. Okay? 
you have to be a believer for those judgments to apply to you. All right? Look at the next verse. For some reason, we have drawn a line between verses 13 and 14 and decided that, oh, we've got a new subject here. But we don't have a new subject. It's continuing the same thing. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? The answer to that question in the, the Greek grammar is no, faith cannot save him. But what's it talking about? Is it talking about heaven or hell? It's not. It's talking about the judgment that God puts upon believers, upon Christians. If you sin, you will be held accountable by God, either in this life or in the next. Okay, but you will be held accountable here through His chastening or at the judgment seat of Christ where you will suffer loss of reward. Okay? So, I mean, this is a continuation. They're harming poor people. So what have we got in verse 15? If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give. Okay, you're pious. Oh, brother, I'll pray for you. And you're sitting there with money in your pocket. Okay, here's a brother in need, and you could help. But instead, brother, the wife and I will mention you in prayer tonight. Oh, good. You know, that's going to help a lot, isn't it? Okay. Um, so what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Um, there's no profit in pious words without real help. Uh, faith by itself, without works, is of no value. And I think that's what he means here when he says it's dead, because it's alone. It doesn't exist because he keeps calling them brethren. They're saved people. They have faith. In fact, he started the chapter, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. Okay? They're hypocrites, is what they are. And they need to get over that. Verse 18, yea, a man may say, does God say? No, a man may say. A man comes and, and throws out a challenge. Prove to me your faith without works, and I'll prove my faith by my works. Can you see faith? Is faith visible? It's not, is it? Okay, I cannot look at a person in this room and say, he's a believer. Okay? I can't do that. You can't look at me and say, I'm a believer. You can't see faith. But if I have works that seem to go along with my faith, then you're probably going to say, oh, he, he's, he's a Christian. He says he's a Christian. He talks about the gospel. And look at the life he's living. He's, he's a decent man. He's a good man. So I believe he's a Christian. Okay? But you cannot see faith. You cannot look at another person and tell whether or not they're saved. And in fact, okay, this is what this, this man who's saying, show me. There's an awful lot of lost people who live better than a lot of Christians. Okay, there's a branch of my family that is Mormon. When my grandpa died, who was a faithful, godly Christian, he was a wonderful man. When my grandfather died, the whole family gathers together for the funeral. Okay? Most of the family is Baptist. Here's this little part of the family that's Mormon. Pretty good part because they all have lots of kids. Um, I got tons of cousins, okay? But guess who looks right? Guess who looks good? The Mormons. They're all dressed to the T. 
their haircuts are all nice. They're clean cut. Okay? They look great. We look pretty bad compared to these folks over here. Okay? Who have swallowed the lies of Joseph Smith who don't really believe in Christ. They say they're Christians, but their gospel is sure not the gospel of the Bible. Okay? If they believe what they claim they believe, they're as lost as, as a friend of mine used to say, a ball in high weeds. You cannot look at a person and tell whether or not they're saved. But this guy throws out this challenge. Now, what does this say to us? This says that Christian people can live rotten lives. And sometimes a whole church can be rotten. And beloved, a lot of us have seen some of those churches. Okay, and it's a shame. It's pitiful. He goes on to talk about justification. If this ver if these verses, um, okay, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? Just, justification means to be declared righteous. If you are declared righteous by God by good works, then you're not saved by grace. And this passage contradicts the, the rest of the Bible. Okay, especially contradicts the letters of the Apostle Paul. Martin Luther decided James was not part of the canon of Scripture because it seemed to say you're justified by works, faith plus works. Okay, so he said, well, it's, it's, it's not really, it shouldn't be in the Bible, is what he, his conclusion was. Um, Romans chapter 4, and we talked about that in another message, makes it very clear that Abraham was justified by faith apart from works. Okay, it wasn't faith plus. It was faith alone. And uh, if you wanted to look at that, Romans chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. Romans chapter 9 through 11, talking about the Jews. And uh, we're not going to look at much here, if anything. Maybe I'll just talk to you about it, and you can look it up on your own. Um, it says that God loved Jacob and hated Esau. And the idea is, ooh, when these were little bitty baby boys, you know, they're just born, and God loved Jacob and hated Esau. Actually, that verse was written 1,500 years after the two were born. It's in Malachi. Okay, it's not in Genesis when they were born. It's in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And it's talking not about the baby Esau, but about his descendants who became a nation that fought against Israel for centuries. Okay, and still are. And one of the Edomites, uh, which is what they were called, was Herod the Great, okay, who tried to kill Jesus and slaughtered the babies around Bethlehem and so on. An exceedingly wicked man, okay. Um, God didn't hate that little baby. Um, there is nothing. In this passage, well, okay, I'll go ahead and say this. It does not say God chose to save Jacob and condemn Esau. Okay, that's the implication the Calvinists draw from this passage, but it doesn't say it. Okay, read it. It doesn't mention their salvation at all. I wouldn't be surprised at all if we get to heaven someday and Esau's there. Okay? He may not be, but he might be. Um, Jacob was chosen to be the father of the nation of Israel. He wasn't chosen for salvation. He was chosen for a service that God wanted him, him to perform. And God chose Jacob to do it instead of Esau. And the thrust of that, that whole chapter is 
God can choose to use whoever He wants to choose. Okay? God's God. And He can do what He wants. But He can only do things that are consistent with His own character. And we've, as we've seen earlier, Calvinism is definitely not consistent with the character of God. God is not choosing to condemn people, creating them and then condemning them without a chance. Okay, which is what the Calvinist says. Uh, did Esau go to hell? I don't know. It doesn't tell us in the Bible whether he did or didn't. Okay, he lost his birthright. Uh, he lost his blessing. Um, God still blessed him. God did a lot for Esau. Esau become a, became a great man and a father of a nation, which unfortunately went astray. Um, then there's Pharaoh there. And it talks about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Um, there are 14 times in the book of Exodus between chapter 4 and, and chapter 9 where it says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Seven times it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Three times it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Four times it doesn't say who did it, it simply says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But having read those passages, I believe in each one of them, the implication is that Pharaoh's heart was hardened because of decisions he made. Okay? Now, if you were to read, and again, we won't take the time, but Romans chapter 1 and it says that mankind, for instance, it says they were not grateful. And so God gave them up. They became foolish. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And then they did this, and God gave them up, and God gave them up, and God gave them up. Okay? And the truth is, if you hear the truth of God, and you reject it, and this applies to Christians as well as lost people. If we hear the Bible and God says, do this or do that, and we refuse, our heart will be hardened. Okay? That happens to everybody. God says, do this, and we say, nope, not going to do that. Your heart will be hardened. The next time God speaks to you and says, do this, it's, it's, it's like developing calluses, okay? I haven't done much manual labor, and I did, I did something just, oh, about a month ago, and I ended up with blisters, okay? Because my hands are kind of soft. They're not tough, okay? Um, it's, it's the same way with our heart, okay? Your heart can be tender, toward God, or your heart can be hard. And if God speaks and you say no, then your heart gets harder. The next time He speaks, it's a little easier to resist Him because you've gotten just a little bit of hardening. And you say no again, and your heart gets harder, and harder, and harder, and harder, until it becomes very difficult for you to say yes, okay? This is not God's fault. It's our doing. Okay? It's also God's doing, and He is just in doing it. Okay? Read Romans chapter 1, the, the last, well, from verse 21 down to the end of the chapter. Um, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. Okay? <laughs> Resist God to your own peril. Okay? That's the truth. Whether you're a lost person rejecting the gospel or a saved person rejecting His leading you on how to live. Okay? If you turn away from God, it's going to hurt you. You often hear, and this is, is the thrust of the... Uh, bad interpretation, I think, of James chapter 2, that if you really believe, if you have saving faith, you will have good works. 
There's not a verse in the Bible that says good works follow faith. Okay, instead, the Bible says that good works follow love. Okay, John chapter 14, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. It doesn't say he, he it is that really believes, is truly born again, has saving faith. It says he loves me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. I will love him, will manifest myself to him. Judas, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. It's not Judas Iscariot. Lord, how is it thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered, said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. It doesn't say if a man really believes, he'll keep my words. It says if he loves me, he'll keep my words. My Father will love him, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my saying. So if you're a disobedient Christian, don't say, oh, but I love the Lord. No, you don't. Okay, if you love the Lord, you'll obey the Lord. Um, the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Okay, if you love the Lord, you'll walk with him. You'll serve Him. You'll obey Him. If you don't love Him, you'll be a disobedient Christian. I'm going to close there. Uh, there's some more that will be in the book. Okay? All right. Um, I hope you know you're going to heaven. Okay? What, what's the whole point of this? The whole point is Jesus died for everybody. And if you trust Christ as your Savior, you'll go to heaven when you die. Okay, and we have a responsibility. We're watchmen that have been told people are in terrible danger. They're in peril of eternity in hell, and we need to warn them. We need to tell them there is a Savior. There is one who died for you and paid for your sins, and you can go to heaven simply by putting your faith in Him. Mm -hmm.